I can't not do that. Uh, Hey, it's good to see you guys here today. I'm Pastor Trent. I'm the lead pastor here. If you are new, I'm glad that you have decided to be with us today. A couple of things before we dive into uh, the message next, uh, or actually tomorrow, uh, Pastor Todd and Christy are headed to Virginia for six weeks of intensive training as they prepare and get trained to be missionaries in Africa. Uh, They'll be back in December. We'll do a big party for them. We'll send them off well, but please be in prayer for them as uh, they leave. And then next Sunday uh, is just really uh, an exciting um, series that we're getting ready to begin. It's really kind of a journey uh, for me the last year, year and a half of just God doing some some stuff in my heart. And so uh, it's a series that we're calling The Place of Peace. And so if you've ever lost anyone, you lost a relationship, lost a loved one, Um, If you've ever dealt with anxiety, worry, bitterness, uh, depression, uh, you're gonna wanna be here over the next few weeks. I believe God's got a word for us and he's gonna do some incredible things. Not to mention, uh, it's been such a powerful thing just in our our, our midst that we actually wrote a worship song uh, called The Place of Peace and and we're gonna put that on the album next uh, spring, but we're actually gonna uh, sing it in this series. So um, I'm excited about it. Hey, if you've got your Bibles, let's go to Luke chapter seven. Uh, We'll be there in just a minute. I wanna start today uh, with a little bit of an eye test. Uh, Anybody up for an eye test today? Probably not. Some of our students are like, I've taken enough tests, I don't need this, but we're gonna watch a video, and uh, the video is gonna give you instructions and, and, and just follow along. And so guys, go ahead and play this, and let's take a look. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. How many passes did you count? The correct answer is 15 passes. But did you see the gorilla? (laughs) All right, how'd you do? (laughs) How many of you saw the gorilla the first time? All right, quite a few of you put your hands down. How many of you did not see it? <laughs> yeah, University of Illinois did this uh, experiment and they say that about half the people see it, about half the people do not see it and it's called selective attention. And so es- essentially what this is, it-, it teaches us human nature and human nature is to be attentive to the things that we wanna be attentive to. We select what awareness and what, what we actually wanna see. So to kind of put it simply today, you see what you wanna see in life, right? You, you see and you are seeing in your life today what you wanna see. And you don't pay attention uh, to the things in your life that you don't wanna pay attention to. It's selective awareness, selective attention. And so if you have problems in your marriage today and you don't wanna see them, then it's easy for you to block them out, it's easy for you to just not think about them, but eventually those issues and problems are gonna catch up to you and you're gonna, you're gonna pay a price for that. Um, you may not see right now that your health is being affected by certain habits in your life, and you can, you can ignore those habits if you want to, but eventually your health is gonna catch up to you. There's a price to pay for that. Uh, you, you may not see Jesus as necessary. You may not think Jesus is important enough to give your life to, but eventually you're gonna be held accountable to your actions. You see what you wanna see, but, but Jesus opens eyes every day, so that's our hope today. And I pray that today Jesus opens up some eyes, Jesus gives you sight to some things in your life that that maybe you've been ignoring or maybe things that you just haven't been aware of or maybe things that you just haven't really wanted to focus on or think about. And and, uh, when we read this passage today, Jesus actually sees this in two different individuals. He uh, is invited over to a Pharisee's house. He's a proper religious man, invites him over to Jesus, uh, uh, invites Jesus over to his house to eat. And and, uh, this man doesn't see clearly and Jesus helps him. And there's also a woman, she's known as a sinner uh, in the community. We don't know her name. She uh, shows up uninvited and then everybody looks at her and sees something in her, but Jesus sees something completely different. And so as we look at this story today, my prayer, my hope is that maybe God is going to show you something that you haven't been seeing in your life. 
You're gonna see something, you're gonna be made aware of something that's going on in your heart, that's happening in your spiritual life that you haven't been paying attention to, that you've been kind of ignoring, and that today the Holy Spirit of God would just open up your heart and open up your eyes. God is gonna tell you something today. I believe God has a word for you today. And uh, I think uh, in, in this moment, what we're gonna do at the end of, of my talk is I, I wanna give everyone an opportunity. If you've never given your life to Jesus to receive his forgiveness and commit your life to him today. And not only that, we're actually going to ask you to get baptized today. Uh, we've got the water, we've got all the clothes you're gonna need, we got hair dryers, we have everything that you're gonna need to make that a reality. There's no excuses other than um, perhaps just disobedience. Uh, but today is your opportunity to do that. You know, baptism is an outward symbol of an inward commitment that we make. And so maybe uh, you were sprinkled as a kid, but uh, maybe you were baptized as a kid, even you got wet. But the reality is we have faith in Jesus. We receive his, his forgiveness. And, and then the scripture says we get baptized. And so, so getting sprinkled, being, you know, getting wet as a baby, that, that does nothing for your faith, biblically speaking. That was great for your parents maybe, but it has nothing to do with your faith, nothing to do with your obedience to Jesus. Jesus. And so today is going to change some lives. I believe the Holy Spirit of God is with us today and uh, he's, he's going to do some work. You guys ready? All right, let's go to Luke chapter seven. We're going to start in verse 36. It'll be here on the screen. It says this, one of the Pharisees asked him, talking to Jesus, to eat with him and, and he went into the Pharisee's house and he reclined at the table and behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head and kissed her feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Yuck. And Jesus answer, answering said to, said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. <laughs> I love this. Simon, I have something to say to you. I believe God has something to say to you this morning. In fact, would you turn to the person beside you and say, God has something to say to you today? Would you tell him that? Go ahead. Give you a second to do that. Now turn to the other person and say, you, you better listen, bro. You better listen. <laughs> you don't want to miss this. You know, Jesus is doing something incredible here. And what's happening is that this religious leader who's known as a Pharisee uh, has invited Jesus over you know, for lunch, dinner, and uh, he's reclining at the table with him. And uh, this Pharisee um, is, is really well respected in the community. He's a religious leader. Um, but ultimately, the Pharisees are the ones that um, took Jesus to the cross and, and they were just completely criticizing him all throughout his ministry. But, but this man, Simon, must have been interested in what Jesus had to say. And so he's over there eating, they're hanging out, out, and uh, it says that they reclined at the table. Now, that's not like Lazy Boy recline, uh, but it's like a table that is low to the ground. This is the, the, the Middle East, at, in this time, this is what they did, and then they would lay down with their head towards the table, kind of lean on their elbows, talk, eat, and their feet would be away from the table, and so this is why this woman, when she walks in, she's able to um, come to Jesus, and she's able to, to wash his feet, and so here they are. They're just eating. They're hanging out, uh, doing their deal, and then this woman shows up. And this isn't just any woman in town. This is a woman uh, who is specifically said is a sinner. Uh, she's a woman of the city. And so most commentators believe that she is either a prostitute, an adulteress. We're not 100% sure. All we know is that the city knows that she is a sinner. She's been caught in sin. And here she is, and she is coming into this place uninvited. And as she walks in, she begins to do something completely inappropriate. First thing she does, she takes down her hair. So her hair was up, she comes in, she lets her hair down. That was offensive, that wasn't a, a, a noble thing to do, that was a very um, immoral thing to do at that time in that culture. When you got married, ladies, your hair was down. As soon as you got married, you put your hair up, you never let it down in public again. So this is the first thing that she's doing. And then what the Bible says is that she's coming in, she's letting down her hair, 
and everyone knows like her sin, and then she begins to weep. And literally there, the word means that she specifically was weeping hysterically. Have you ever gotten to the point to where you're just like crying so hard, you just like can't hardly breathe, and it's like a snot cry, and like a, <laughs> you know, that kind of deal? You've been there? This is kind of where this woman is at, and she is crying so hard, she's weeping so hard that the tears are coming down her cheek and falling on the feet of Jesus, making his feet so wet that now she is then able to take her hair and wipe off the dirty, dusty feet of our Lord. Now, the next thing she does is every woman typically would wear like a little uh, flask of, of ointment, perfume around their neck, very expensive uh, if you were able to afford that. And this woman evidently had this and she anoints Jesus's feet uh, and kisses his feet uh, all the while weeping and in tears as she, as she does this. Uh, this would have been the, probably the most expensive thing she, she ever had. And here she is sacrificing it to Jesus. Now, Simon is sitting there and he's like, hold up. Uh uh-uh. uh, not in my house. You are not bringing that trash in here. You are not coming in here disrespecting me, disrespecting my guest. He's thinking, how in the world can this Jesus really be a holy man? How can he be a prophet of God? Uh, and how can he let a woman who is a sinner, hello, do this? He should have known what kind of woman she is. But Simon doesn't realize that Jesus's ministry is all about bringing the good news to the poor, the hopeless, the broken, the disenfranchised, the sinners of the world like me and like you. From Simon's perspective, she enters the room like a disease. Mm, what is she doing? She is not holy. She doesn't keep the law. She is trash. She's a sinner. She doesn't belong here. She is unclean. He is turning up his nose at her in self-righteousness. And he is looking at her in a way that is condemning her. He's doing all this in his mind. He's not saying this. He's doing it in his mind. And remember, you see what you want to see. When you see a woman, when you see a man who you think is maybe far from God, how do you see him? How do you see her? Simon looks at her in self-righteousness and sees a sinner not, a sinner not worthy of his time. But what we have to do is we have to begin to change the way that we see Some of us don't see as we need to see. We don't see as Jesus sees, right? Here's what we need to know. Jesus would want you to know this today. He knows everybody has a story. And this woman has a story. We don't know what her story is. I'm just guessing. I'm just throwing out ideas here this morning. But uh, I know you don't just fall into the life of a prostitute. You just don't fall into adultery overnight. Um, these, these, These kinds of things happen because of various things that are going on in your life. Maybe her husband died. She was young. No life insurance. Didn't have a house. Didn't have any kids. And so here she is. Uh, Poverty. Uh, She has no way to fend for herself. No way to support herself. Can't get a job. It's not like America. Government's not helping. So maybe she falls into that. Maybe as a kid, her parents had a debt that they couldn't pay. And so they had to sell their kid into slavery. And now she's a, you know, she's, she's in this life. So I don't know. All I know is she has a story. And every single person in here has a story as well. I'm not excusing the sin that she's experiencing. I'm not excusing my sin or anybody's sin. But what I'm saying is that everybody has a story. And before you write somebody off as a sinner, not worthy of your time, not worthy to invite to your house, not worthy for you to associate with, we need to realize that there's a reason why people are broken and hurting today. Matter of fact, there's a reason why you walk into this room today from the very top of the seating all the way here to the front. There is a reason why we're here and some of us are hurting. There are many reasons why there's some emptiness and and, and hopelessness in our heart today. There are struggles that each of us are going through. You see, Simon saw a disease, but Jesus saw a daughter. You see, we have to change the way that we look at life. We have to have a worldview shift. We have to change the way that we look at people. We have to change our vision. And the only person that can do that is Jesus. Your story is what God is gonna use to shape you. Every single one of you have one. He's using that story to shape you, to, uh, to equip you to help others in the future. Now parts of your story you're ashamed of. Parts of your story you wish weren't there. Parts of your story you wish you could forget about, but you can't. 
God's gonna use that mess, he's gonna use that brokenness, and if you allow him, he's gonna use that mess for your good and for his glory. Sure, there are ugly parts, but Jesus' love and Jesus' power is greater than any messed up story in the room. And he wants to give you a brand new start. He wants to give you a brand new heart. And if you allow him today, he'll forgive you of your sins. You'll experience his grace and mercy. He'll break the chains of sin that are holding you back in your life. He'll allow his spirit to live within you. The old will be gone. The new man, the new woman will be born. And this is all because of the power of Jesus' gospel and his message for us. He offers you forgiveness today. The question is, are you gonna see him as he truly is? Now, Simon is in his head, he's doubting that Jesus is a man of God. He's doubting that Jesus is in fact a prophet of God. And so in his mind, he's doubting, just like some of you are doubting that Jesus is real. You're doubting that Jesus can do anything unique for you. You're doubting maybe that even Jesus could forgive you of your sins because you're like, Trent, you, you don't know what I've done. You don't know the sins that I've committed. You don't know how, how, you don't know my story, man. You don't know how terrible and how bad. You don't know what I'm going through. It's just, I'm, I'm ashamed. And you're thinking in your head, like, how can Jesus forgive me? But here, I think, are the words that Jesus wants you to hear as well. See, Simon is having these thoughts in his head, but Jesus is like, hey, Simon, I wanna tell you something. And uh, he reveals his thoughts by telling him a parable. And a parable is simply a story that Jesus tells that has a point. And so here's what he tells in verse 41. He says, a certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay it, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, right? Any basketball players in the room? Like, you know what a no-look pass is? Like, if I'm looking at you and, and I pass it over here, that's a no-look pass. Jesus is about to do a no-look lesson. Like, he's looking, he's looking at the woman, but he's talking to you and me today, okay? Here we go. He says this in verse 44. Do you see this woman? Everybody look up here. Do you see this woman? Do, do you see what she is, is really doing? Do you see the life that she is demonstrating to you and I today? We have to put away all of the self-righteousness in our life and we have to see this woman for who she truly is and what she's demonstrating to us. I'm gonna tell you in just a minute. He says, I entered your house, Simon. You gave me no water. You didn't give me any water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and she wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she's not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with oil. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. They're gone. For she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this dude who even says that he forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. Mm, I love this. I love what Jesus is teaching us here. It's something greater than what you might imagine today. Jesus wants Simon's worldview to change. He wants him to see differently, just like he wants you to see differently today. He wants you to see people differently. He wants you to see yourself differently. He wants you to recognize and see your own sin and how it separated you from God. He wants us to see, see clearly today, and he wants us to see Essentially, by looking at this woman, this is what he wants Simon to see, this is what he wants you and I to see. He wants us to see in action what true repentance and true love really looks like. This is what he wants us to see. Some of us think we have faith, some of us think we have salvation, but we do not. For our life does not demonstrate that faith. Our life does not demonstrate that we have put Jesus at the center of our life. It does not demonstrate the fact that we have received forgiveness. And so Simon here thinks he's holy. He thinks he is, you know, a man of God. He thinks he's got everything in line. He thinks he's the good one 
and this woman is the bad one. The woman needs help, I don't need help. And Jesus says, hey dude, let me just tell you something. You're looking at how she's messed up, let me tell you how you're messing up, all right? It's really easy to look at other people and say, oh, they're not that good. Not that good, I can tell by what they post and how they do this and what the, mm mm-hmm. It's not so easy to look in the mirror and see what's going on in here, is it? See, Simon didn't show the common courtesies that he was supposed to show as a host to Jesus when he entered his home. So the common courtesies were simply to, hey, when you come to uh, the house, you are first greeted with a a holy kiss, a, a kiss of peace. And so we don't do that in America, Thank you, Jesus, but not that kind of guy. <laughs> but you know, like in France and in Europe, sometimes they do that, you know, so you've seen this. This is what they did back in the day. This was a greeting, common greeting, like shaking hands. Um, Simon didn't give, him, didn't give him the proper greeting. Disrespectful. Didn't think he was important enough. Now, you're, you're, you're walking on a dusty road all day. You have open you know, sandals, and so your feet were always dirty, and so when you got to the house, common courtesy was, here's some water, let's wash off your feet, because that's refreshing, and you don't want to walk around, I don't want you walking around my house, with the, my house with those dogs barking anyway, let's clean them up. So that's a good thing. Then they anointed uh, the, the head, right? a little oil on your head, kind of refreshing, kind of hope, hopefully make you smell a little bit better, no deodorant back in the day, so these are all good common courtesies. And Simon has rejected all of them. Simon has denied them. Simon hasn't thought Jesus was worthy enough to do any of them. And so here is Jesus, and he's saying, Simon, you didn't do any of these things. But from the moment this woman, this so-called sinner, who's not worthy of your time, shows up, she has not stopped weeping and washing my feet and anointing my feet and kissing my feet as a sign of humility, as a sign of love, as a sign of worship, because when you are experiencing great forgiveness, it leads you to great gratitude. And if you have not recognized your sin, if you have not recognized your utter stance before a holy God, as a sinner separated from him, then you think you're good, I'm good. All those people, they need it. I don't need it, just those people, right? That's self-righteousness. And Simon wants Jesus around, he wants him in his house, he wants him to hang out. But just like some of you, you want just enough of Jesus to make you feel okay, but you don't want him close enough to make you change anything in your life. I just want all the stuff I want and Jesus, I'll let you in. I want you to be a part of my life, like kind of outside the house. I don't want you inside the house. I, I want to go to heaven, but I don't want you in here, right? I, you know, I want to I wanna be a good person, but I don't want you, I don't want you in here because then you're going to require me to change something. You want him close, but you want him far enough away that you don't have to make any changes. Now, when we look at this story, there's a few things that, that we've got to gather here. You, you, we got to recognize, and this is, I think, what Simon is, is really becoming and, and understanding, is that you can't hide your sin from Jesus. Like this woman, her sins have been exposed in the community. Simon thinks that his sins are hidden. And we will do everything that we can to try to keep our sins hidden. You're doing a good job hiding from your wife, You might be doing a good job hiding your sin from your kids, but I can promise you this, you cannot hide your sin from Jesus. He will expose you. You will either confess them or he will expose you in this life and most definitely the life to come. You cannot continue to live life in secrecy, especially if you are a child of God. You see, what we have to know here is that Jesus is the son of God and he knows every thought that we have. He knows everything you're going through today, you can't fool him, you can't hide from him. He knows if you're living self-righteously today, he knows if you've truly repented of your sin or if you're just faking it today. And there's probably a lot of people in the room that are faking it, there's probably a lot of people in the room who think that you're good. I'm good, I don't, I don't need anything, like I'm good. And a lot of times that self-righteousness in this you know, moralistic you know, culture that we live in here in the South, we think, you know, we're better than other people. 
We have a better theology. We have a better house, a better car, education, better income. We live in a better town. Our skills are better. Our beliefs are better. Everything about us is better. And when you think like that, you don't think that you need much of God. You think you only need a little bit of forgiveness. That person needs a lot of forgiveness. I only need a little bit, God, so thank you. I prayed a prayer. I'm good. I live my life. I'm a, I'm a good enough person. I'm, essentially, you're just, you're just trying to be moral. Because when we read the scriptures, self-righteousness is grounded in pride, which is the number one sin. <laughs> so it's like the biggie. It's like the worst. So self-righteous people think that they're okay, but they're committing, in fact, the worst of the worst, thinking you don't need God, thinking you don't need his help. You're not understanding your own sin. You know, the scripture says that before faith in Christ, we're enemies of God. Think about that. An enemy of God. If you don't think you're an enemy of God right now, um, it's only because of your faith in Christ or you don't think you're that bad of a person. The Bible says the very best that we can do is like a dirty, filthy rag before a holy God. There's nothing that we can do to earn his favor or earn his love or, or, or to you know, create a, a, a bridge that would allow us to go to heaven apart from faith in Jesus. There's nothing. Ultimately, without Christ, we're separated from God. We don't have purpose. We don't have hope. There's no joy. And there's no eternal life. And this is where Simon is at. He wouldn't dare say it out loud, but he thought it. But the woman, on the other hand, she's recognizing her sin. She's recognizing her need for Jesus. And she demonstrates great love to Jesus. Listen, great forgiveness leads to great gratitude. And this is where she's at. Now, she has probably had an experience with Jesus prior to this. She's heard him teach. She accepted him as Lord and Savior. She received his forgiveness. And now she's showing up. And now she is expressing her love and gratitude to him, don't miss that. Washing feet and crying doesn't save you. This is an act of gratitude because of the forgiveness that she has already experienced, what she's already been given. I think um, there's a lot of people though, especially in the South, um, we're very self-sufficient. And uh, I think self-sufficiency is one of those things that will always keep you from Jesus. If you think that you're okay, if you think that you're good, if you think that you know, you've got everything worked out, we know we, we've been there. Self-sufficiency keeps a lot of people from Jesus because there's no desperation for him, there's no urgency, there's no true awareness of our sinfulness before a holy God. And we, we kinda think that you know, our sin isn't that bad. And, and as a result of that, we begin to live in this self-sufficient mentality, thinking that everything is okay, I'm not that bad, I don't really need Jesus, I kinda just need some of them. You ever ask people how they're doing and their first response is, good, I'm good. We all think we're good, we're good. We might be lying, but we say we're good, we're all good, we're busy, we're just busy, everything's good, just busy. Good and busy takes people to hell every day. And we have to see as Jesus sees. We have to see our sin as Jesus sees it. Before a holy God, you deserve hell for eternity. Without payment for that sin that you cannot paint, then that is your destiny. If you aren't depending on Jesus today, you think you're good, you don't need forgiveness, you don't need any help, I know that you're experiencing a lostness. I, I, I just know it, I, I've been there. There's an emptiness there. There's a, a lack of purpose there. Most likely this woman is hearing Jesus. She's coming here, talking to him and experiencing this moment as a way to show his, her thankfulness to him. He said to her, your sins are forgiven. It literally means that your sins have already been forgiven. She's in a state of forgiveness. And Jesus is here assuring her of that Forgiveness. Now all the Pharisees are there and they're like shaking their heads. Jesus is saying your sins are forgiven and he's like, and all the Pharisees are like, hold up, no. Only God can forgive sins. Who does this guy think he is? He's crossing the line saying that he forgives her of sins. There's no way that he's able to do this. And, and listen, her faith, Jesus says, is what saves her. And he says your sins have been 
forgiven. Let's not miss this point today. Only Jesus can forgive sin and satisfy your deepest needs. Every single one of you as human beings, we have deep-seated needs. Needs to belong, needs to feel loved and accepted. We have a need in our life to see that we matter. We, 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 we have a purpose in life. That's put there by God. But what we do with these deep needs is we try to find them in other people. We try to find them in feelings from alcohol or drugs. We try to find them in success. We try to find them in whatever area your heart longs for. But every time you try, it works for a little bit. But at the end of the day, the week is over. You go back to bed and in your mind, you're thinking, I just don't feel complete. Something's not right. And the reason is because only Jesus satisfies your deepest needs. And only Jesus can actually forgive our sins. And when Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm, I'm offering forgiveness to you, what he's saying is, I forgive you when there's repentance. Repentance is I am walking this way and when I turn from my sin and my life of selfishness, I turn to the way of Jesus. This is what repentance is. Now sure, I still struggle with sin and I'm gonna deal with that. But Jesus forgives us when there's repentance. We all know people who are just like, honey, I'm sorry, go do it again. Honey, I'll never do it again. That night, did it again. That's not true repentance. That's, I wanna, I wanna please somebody so I can get out of this room so I don't have to talk about this anymore. I'm really, really sorry. I might even cry about it. But at the end of the day, have you severed that sin and are you now living and walking as a man of God? That's what repentance is. Some of you haven't experienced that. That's why Jesus is telling, this is what Jesus is trying to show Simon. This is what it looks like. This is what humility and desperation look like. Have you experienced this moment in your life where you, where, where you have totally been aware of your sin? I am a sinner in need of God's grace and his love. I can't do this on my own. And by faith, you receive Jesus into your life and you begin to walk with him. This is what salvation looks like. You know, Usually, uh, nobody thinks they need a Tic Tac, <laughs> you know? <sighs> I'm good, I'm good, right? Uh, every week, you know, there's somebody that will say, Pastor Trent, thanks for that message. I am so glad my husband heard that. <laughs> Simon, you know, right? I'm so glad my kids are here to hear this. Like, that's self-righteousness. I know we don't mean that, but that is why it's so sneaky, it creeps into your life. I'm good, man. I don't need a tic-tac. Those sinners need it. And I'm glad you said it. And I'm glad they need to go grab some. But I'm good. I wonder if today some of you would be honest and say, I'm not good. I'm not good. Because you're not sure that you have given your life to Christ. If you died today, you have no idea where you would spend an eternity. You're not good. You've selected what you want to be aware of and you have just decided not to think about this. You've decided not to focus on it, not to deal with it. I'm just gonna show up to church and then I'll feel good about myself and then I'll leave and then I'll feel bad by Friday, then I'll need to come. And that whole routine is part, maybe part of your life, but, but I wonder, have you ever just said by faith, Jesus, forgive me, and have you just decided to live your life for him? See, it's, it's faith that saves you. It's not washing feet. It's not living a good life. You, you, we, we just can't do it. It's faith in Jesus. It's faith that says, I believe that Jesus is the son of God. He died on the cross for my sins and that he rose from the grave. And by faith, we receive his payment on the cross for our sins. And by trusting in that payment, we are saying, yes, I believe that I am forgiven. And yes, now I am walking in victory with Jesus do you see that today? Have you yourself done that today? Have you ever experienced that? What I love about this woman is that she came publicly to Jesus. Just think about the shame that she would have been experiencing in this moment. Everybody knows you're a sinner, you're that one, and yet she still came in front of everybody. She still said, I don't care what y'all think. I wanna be with Jesus. I don't care what you guys are gonna say about me. 
I don't care if you're gonna make fun of me. I don't care, you know, what, what's gonna happen. I know y'all are gossiping and talking about me. I don't care. I wanna be with Jesus. And Jesus is in this moment forgiving her sins and he's telling everybody around the room and he wants everybody in the town to know that, hey, this woman who you see as a sinner, she's forgiven. She's a different person now. So not only is she coming publicly to Jesus, but Jesus is now publicly saying she's a changed woman, right? You see, the, the problem with us sometimes is that we wanna make decisions privately. We wanna follow Jesus secretly. Some of you have made decisions to follow Christ, even at our church, but you haven't told anybody and you haven't gotten baptized. It's disobedience. Some of you maybe came to faith, maybe as a high school student or college student, you've never been baptized. It's disobedience. And so I'm wondering today if, if finally, just like this woman, if you would say, you know what, I don't care what people are gonna think about me. I don't care what's going on around me. I, I wanna give my life to Jesus and I wanna go public with my faith. And that would require you to be baptized. Baptism is that outward symbol. We go under the water representing the fact that the old trend is dead, that we are dying with Christ. We come up out of the water as a symbol that Jesus rose from the grave, that I am a brand new creation, that now I am no longer bound by my sin. Now I am a new creation in Christ. A lot of symbolism there, step of obedience. Some of you need to take that today. Some of you need to make this decision to say once and for all, like, okay, I, want, I, I need Jesus. I'm tired of thinking I'm good. I'm tired of pretending like everything is all together. Jesus is exposing me today and I'm ready to give my life to him.